At the end of this video, you should be fully convinced that LDL cholesterol is not the cause of her disease. And it's actually caused by an infection. And that infection is preceded by a really bad diet, including seed oils and sugar, ultra processed foods. Now, in the last few weeks, I've been studying a lot about this subject because I have uh, a patient with a really good success story that I talked about. I did an interview with him. And in a few months, I'll be on stage in front of 150 medical doctors. I'll be discussing meat, keto, carnivore, and why it's healthy for 45 minutes. After that, there's going to be a vegan speaking for 45 minutes on why meat is bad and plants are good. And then we sit down for an hour, an hour and we debate each other and we take questions from the audience. So I've been studying a lot. And there's quite a few doctors on YouTube who talk about the randomized control trials and the epidemiological observational studies that show that LDL is the cause of heart disease. And the solution would be seed oils and avoiding meat. And that doesn't make logical sense because we've been eating meat since the dawn of time. And heart disease has been a factor in our healthcare since about 1910, not earlier. So there's something that was invented a few years before that, maybe 20 years before that, that's causing heart disease. And there's a guy named Dr. White. He traveled the country in the United States around that time, and he was interviewing people that had suffered this new weird phenomenon called the heart attack. And then he presented, I believe, in 1913 at a conference to medical doctors, and he pretty much booed him off the stage because they knew it existed, but they didn't have any solutions for heart disease and heart attacks. So through this video, I'm going to go over, uh, go through some of the people I've been watching, and they have the best science, but they're missing stuff, and I'm going to go over what they're missing. And these guys are MDs and PhDs, and they're cardiologists, and but I have an advantage over them. So number one, I'm a chiropractor. Number two, I don't do drugs. I don't sell drugs. I don't prescribe drugs. Number three, I have to get people well with supplements and diet. Number four, I see a wide variety of patients. Cardiologists see heart patients. Dermatologists see skin patients. Having specialists like this is very detrimental to um, healthcare because it's hard to connect all the dots together. Except for in my practice, I see people with multiple, multiple sclerosis, cancer, heart disease, skin rashes, fatigue. I have autistic kids. So I see a wide variety of people and I'm dealing with nutrition and there's these fundamental common denominators that I discover. Now it's been 30 years of studying nutrition and I've been practicing since 1998 and I, can, I like to solve puzzles. So I'm finding common underlying common denominators that if I were specializing in the foot, for example, as a podiatrist, then I probably wouldn't be able to solve these puzzles because of the specialization. So I don't have a specialty other than I heal the body from head to toe using si uh, supplements and diet. So we're going to go over also studies that show that seed oils cause harm to the human body. Now, one of the underlying premises of uh, PubMed, the USDA, um, the university professors, the MDs, the cardiologists, they all say seed oils are really good. They're better than eating meat. Plant oil is better than animal fats. It's not true, although it does show that when people eat plant oils and they reduce their animal fats, they live longer and they have less heart disease. So, and that's primarily through epidemiological studies. So we have to debunk a little bit on, on observational epidemiological studies, and I'm going to get into that. But then if, if it's not true, so if LDL is not the cause of heart disease, then what is? So we're going to get into that too. This is going to, um, I need you to follow through with me through all the way to the end so you can understand uh, what we're discussing here. And I'm going to propose it's infection. And I'm going to show you that um, some some statistics and some information, and this is just the beginning because I have a lot more information that I'll release in more videos in the future. But even with this video, you should be pretty well convinced that it's infection causing heart disease and not LDL. It's infection and seed oils and sugar that destroy LDL, and that is part of inflammation, and that's part of the inflammatory cycle of all chronic disease. But it's not LDL causing the disease. It's other things that are causing the, the disease, and LDL happens to become diseased.
because of these other factors. I'm going to introduce you to my cardiologist when, in 2016 when I had mold and I had horrible chest pain. I went to see him. I've known him since 1998, and he might be the smartest person that I know. And as he talks, we're going to talk about different organisms that infect the, the heart and uh, affect the heart. And then we're going to go over some um, hazard ratios, like what actually, in relationship to each other, where does smoking fit in, where does uh, LDL fit in, where does diabetes fit in when it comes to causing heart disease. So I have all that listed out in a, in a uh, most important to least important um, list. And then the last thing I'm going to go over is the ossification or the calcification of soft tissue like the heart and placking and calcification of the arteries and how that actually happens. So we, we have this whole disease process from bad diet to you know, final heart disease. And then we're gonna actually go through um, all the way to the end and how, do, how does placking actually occur. It, it's super interesting and you gotta know what it is or else we're kinda lost as to like what we're talking about. So this is gonna be a really interesting video and um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on any single subject but it's a lot of different subjects put together. And like I said, at the end, you'll know it's infection. It's not LDL. And it's our seed oils. Even though all the organizations, associations, medical doctors, they're all promoting seed oils, it's not. It, it's, the seed oils are, are part of the problem. And you'll see this beginning right now. This is the website of Dr. Kate Shanahan. Here's her social media handle right here, at Dr. Kate with a C. And this graphic shows the increase in polyunsaturated fatty acids, from seed oils, and the, the seed oils are scaled in pounds per person per year. So here at the very top, it's 100 pounds of seed oils per person per year. That's a lot, and um, we're ending at 2020. Diabetes and pre-diabetes is going up along right along with it. Now, correlation does not equal causation, but you can certainly see that there are some things that are not correlated, therefore not causative, of diabetes and prediabetes. So carbohydrates are this yellow line down here. And I do know that the uh, increase in sugar has actually leveled off around 2020 and it started to come down. So, and margarine is kind of flat, butter is flat, lard is flat. They're not rising up along with seed oils and diabetes and prediabetes. The consumption of um, eggs are down and red meat is down 28% in the last 50 years. It's the only meat that's up is actually chicken. So now ch of all the meats, chicken has actually the most amount of omega-6 fatty acids. So that's part of the seed, it's not a seed oil, but it's part of these um, omega-6 fatty acids. Okay, so now there's a term called abnosis, and that means observing the obvious. So when you see the, all these animal foods are coming down or they're leveling off over the last 100 years, then you can see that those are not the cause of this increase in diabetes and prediabetes. But seed oils is the only thing going up, except for maybe glyphosate, the spraying of Roundup in our agricultural fields. That might be a, another correlation that's related. So just something to keep in mind, but I'm going to talk about seed oils, and we're going to get more into this right now. So there's a variety of YouTube and uh, TikTok personalities that promote seed oils. This is Dr. Gil uh, Carvello. He's an MD, PhD, and he's a super smart guy, and, he's, um, and I don't think he's biased. He is a vegan. He is a part of a vegan group led by Dr. Katz, you know, total vegan group. But when he looks at the research and what he's saying on his channel, which is uh, Nutrition Made Simple, that's the name of the channel, I don't see bias. Now, I've contacted him, and I've sent him about 20 studies, and I'm going to show you these studies rel relatively quickly. He hasn't gotten back to me on those studies, and maybe he'll incorporate them into some future video. If he doesn't, because they debunk his message, then I know that he's biased. But we'll see what happens. Now, this guy, uh, Simon Hill, vegan. I think all these people are vegan or Mediterranean diet, vegetarian. And they all quote the same scientific studies. Here's Dr. Ids on TikTok, 1.8 million followers. Here's Dr. Terry Simpson, a Mediterranean diet um, advocate, weight loss surgeon. And I called him out on social media. He blocked me. And then Dr. Allo, um, he not only promotes seed oils, but he also promotes sugar. He's saying sugar doesn't make you fat or cause diabetes or heart disease. 
And um, these are my comments to him. But they all quote the absolute best science, and that's randomized clinical controlled trials and the meta-analyses of these RCTs. And then they have the big human clinical outcome observational epidemiological studies. And the message is always the same. Seed oils, number one, lower LDL cholesterol. Seed oils, number two, do not raise inflammation. And then through the observational studies, seed oils, um, people who consume seed oils live longer lives. That's the main message. And it's super convincing, and it makes um, a strong argument. Let me just start with the observational studies. The chance of getting truth from an observational study is 1 in 100 to 1 in 1,000. And it's because of their design. They're not scientific. Now, I don't look at observational studies because usually the results are backwards. And especially with dietary observational studies where they have a survey, and they're trying to find out, like, what are people eating throughout the, throughout the last 30 years? The main problem with these big epidemiological observational studies is if you're studying, like, let's say 1 million people, and half of them are consuming seed oils and the other half are not, and they're eating bacon instead, there's going to be a lot of other variables that uh, are not taken into account. For example, people that are more healthy have a certain series of habits that keep them thin and they exercise and they listen to their doctor, they take medications, they eat healthy food, they have salads for lunch, and they wear their seat belts, and they don't ride motorcycles, and they don't shoot guns. But the people on the other side of the spectrum, they're called non-adherers. They don't listen to their doctor. They eat red meat, they don't eat beans and uh, salad, and they shoot guns, and they ride motorcycles, and they don't wear their seat belt, they drink, they smoke. So the, there's the adherers, and there's the non-adherers. And that is what plays out in all these observational studies. And there's just too many factors. So when the adherers are consuming seed oils, they're you know, using sunflower oil or canola oil instead of um, bacon grease, you can't say that that's you know, making them healthy, that the, sun, the uh, seed oils are making them healthy. Now, they do have a lower mortality rate, but there's just so many other factors that have to come into play and have to be considered. So that's one of the largest problems with these large epidemiological observational studies. And the other thing is, it's a survey. There's no science. They're, they don't do something to a group of people. They don't tell half the people to um, change your diet or something. It's just a survey, like how's your health and, and what do you eat for, for your meals? So um, with the science, you have to do something to a group of people. And that's called a clinical trial. Okay, but what about the randomized control trials on the seed oils? Well, they show LDL goes down, and they show uh, lower incidence of heart attack. And, okay, great. And if that's true, that's awesome. So, but is it possible that seed oils can lower um, LDL and lower heart attack incidence and actually ex extend, more, uh, extend the longevity of life? And that's what these studies are showing through um, observational studies and RCTs. Okay, but seed oils destroy human tissue. They cause problems. And we're gonna go over that. I have about 20 studies or so. And so you, you may live a longer life, but you have all these other problems. You may have less heart attacks, but you have all these other problems. So there's holes in their arguments, and I'm gonna show you this right now. And as I go through this material, there's more and more holes that show up. And I've been watching these guys for a long time now, many weeks, many hours. What's missing? There is something that's missing. And if everybody understood this one thing that's missing, everything makes sense. And this one thing is infection. So we'll go into that in a bit. But first, let's go over these studies. I'm not going to talk too long on any one of them. So this one is the association between linoleic acid levels. That's the polyunsaturated fatty acids and colostrum in breast milk for children and their cognition and physical development was poorer at the age of two and three so linoleic acid destroys colostrum and breast milk and children and then same thing with this one pregnancy lactation the first two years of life the linoleic acid omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids found in seed oils harm uh, the utilization and absorption of fish oil, so D EPA and DHA, these super healthy omega-3 fats that everybody talks about. Kids' brains need these fats, and when the mom is consuming seed oils, 
then the kids uh, don't get the uh, DHA and EPA that they need because the seed oils block it and prevent the absorption of it. Uh, this one is about migraines, so they exacerbate migraines, the, omega, the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. They lower endosthenedione, testosterone, and free testosterone in men. They also reduce sperm count. And the sperm count fertility in men has dropped like a brick in the last, what, 50 years or something. Seed oils exacerbate or cause macular degeneration. Here, they can cause bone mineral density to be lower in older adults. So that's osteoporosis, osteopenia. Here we have pain. So seed oils contribute to pain, which is a huge epidemic. Linoleic acid destroys red blood cells and hemoglobin. The next one is linoleic acid. Lowering these seed oils reduces oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. So these are called oxalams. And they cause trouble throughout the body, including Alzheimer's, et cetera. Linoleic acid in the um, umbilical cord on a newborn, if it's higher, it means that the kid is more likely to be smaller, you know, less healthy, smaller weight. So the, the lower the weight is for a, a newborn, the higher the mortality. Here we have a low omega-6 to omega-3 PUFA ratio diet. So they have a bunch of kids, average age of 14, and what they did was um, they were obese, but they put them on a diet so, such that they didn't lose any weight. What they did was they lowered the omega-6, the PUFAs, linoleic acid, seed oils. They lowered that, and they raised up the omega-3. That ratio is important. So we have this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. They increased the 3, lowered the 6. Here's what happened. They didn't lose weight. They weren't trying to lose weight. They tried to keep the calories the same. But what happened was fatty liver decreased 26%. That's huge because fatty liver is implicated with diabetes. 34% reduction in liver enzyme ALT, 22% reduction in triglycerides, 26% improvement in insulin sensitivity. And then the oxlams, which I mentioned earlier before, um, also went down. So here we have only a 38 3.28% reduction in LDL cholesterol. So what? That's insignificant, and you'll learn why. Okay, but moving on. That's an amazing study right there. So changes in dietary fat alter uh, plasma levels of oxidized LDL and lipoprotein A. So when you look at what these researchers are saying on, on social media, they're saying, number one, when LDL is oxidized, it's like a rusty car, right? It's a damage to the car, oxidized LDL. It's damaged LDL. That causes disease. But the solution that they say is just lower all the LDL, and then you're done. Boom. You can crush it down with drugs. You can do a vegetarian diet. You can exercise a lot. Keep your LDL down. That's their main message. So, if, But if you have, let's say, 100 units of LDL cholesterol, and 1% of them is oxidized, do you really need to lower it? No, because you have 99 uh, units that are healthy. Now, the healthy LDL is a big fluffy molecule. And then the sick or oxidized LDL is a very small and dense molecule. And let's say you have 100 units, again, and 90% of them are oxidized. They're small and dense, and they're causing trouble. Do you want to lower that down? Potentially, yes. Take, you know, lipid uh, lowering drugs like statins can, can do that. And this is especially true if you're eating junk food and you don't have a healthy diet. And we'll get to that in a second. So just bear with me because it's kind of a big subject here. Now, lipoprotein A, also a horrible um, molecule for uh, heart health. Now, when I had black mold, my lipoprotein A was double what it should have been. And that mold and the mycotoxins from mold those damage everything and they cause harm and it took me a few years but i got the, my lipoprotein down to normal after that the mold is an infection and so maybe people's lipoprotein a and their oxidized ldl is up because of mold maybe it's candida maybe it's parasites bear with me next study this is a apparent paradox of low fat healthy diets increasing plasma levels of oxidized L ldl and lipoprotein a this is a commentary on this previous one right here. But these people are saying, look, people went on your healthy diet 
and they ate seed oils and they ate vegetables and they reduced the meat, but yet they had an increase in LDL and lipoprotein A, oxidized LDL even. What's the disconnect here? Something's wrong. He's just calling attention to that there's something else that's another factor that can make people have oxidized LDL go up or down based on their diet or the lipoprotein A goes up or down. So now I'm just going to tell you right now, I, again, I think it's infection. Bear with me. We'll get to that. Association between blood, PUFAs, and depressive symptoms in breast cancer survivors. So women who survived breast cancer had more depression when they had more polyunsaturated fatty acids in their body and they're consuming more linoleic acid. This is a study showing that plasma concentrations of these polyunsaturated fatty acids can lead to asthma in uh, children. And this is more of a bigger observational study, which I'm not a super fan of, but we're talking about lungs right here. So this says that they can be related to uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so COPD. And this one is saying when you cook with the seed oils, you get this metabolite from the process of cooking. That's been impl implicated for Alzheimer's disease. Now, earlier I mentioned oxlams. Those are other metabolites. So when you cook these um, seed oils, they break down. When you go to a restaurant, they're cooking French fries with these seed oils over and over and over again. Um, sometimes they'll hold the same oil in the deep fryer for a week, and they're just using it, and it just becomes degraded more and more, causing uh, metabolites that can destroy your body. So I just went over all these studies showing how seed oils destroy tissue. And if you're a cardiologist, all you care about is cardiology. And so your heart is uh, protected by lowering the LDL by taking seed oils. But what about the rest of the body? So this is, again, where I see this wide variety of patients, and I don't specialize in any one thing. And I can see that people have chronic issues, and when I get them off of junk food, these chronic issues go away. Junk food being filled with seed oils, refined white sugar, refined white grains, and then sometimes extra added salt. So the American diet is currently 57% junk food, and the American grocery stores are currently about 72% junk food, ultra-processed food. So we have to change that around so that we can get away from the seed oils and the excess sugar and excess refined carbohydrates. Here's a compilation of studies regarding all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease for three different conditions. So here we have body mask index. So when somebody is more overweight, Let's say their BMI is greater than 25. Here's 25 right here. Their BMI is 25. They're perfectly healthy. And the hazard ratio is 1.0. That means there's uh, no detriment or benefit regarding any kind of disease. You're not protected from a disease. And you're not being uh, having a disease. You don't have a risk of it. So as you get more overweight, these numbers go up above 1.0. So that's detrimental. Also, if you're underweight and it goes up above 1.0 over here, that's also detrimental. So 25 BMI is ideal. And that's for actually cardiovascular disease. Now here we have all-cause mortality. And that's the same story. So if your BMI is about 25 to 27, 8, 9, you're healthy. This is pretty good. But you become overweight or you go underweight, your all-cause mortality goes up. It goes up to 2.2. Your hazard ratio goes up. Now, women are pink and men are blue in this, um, in this graphic. And here we have blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, here's 120 right there. Your cardiovascular disease hazard ratio goes up when it goes higher. And your all-cause mortality goes up when it goes higher. Okay, so with these first two columns, I'm preparing you for this third column right here. This is non-HDL cholesterol. So we're, we're talking about LDL cholesterol and other cholesterols minus HDL, you compile those numbers together. And if your number is over 110 here, your um, line goes below 1.0. That means you're protected from cardiovascular, from, from all-cause mortality. You actually live longer if your non-HDL cholesterol goes up from like 100 to 200. You live longer whether you're male or female right here. This is 200. This is 100. When your non-HDL cholesterol goes uh, down, your all-cause mortality goes up. You die sooner with lower LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is for the immune system. It helps your body get rid of infections. It acts like a soap, and it can soak up um, endotoxins from bacteria. We'll get more into that. 
oh, Dale's a good thing. It's the infection that's a bad thing. It's the infection that causes placking and inflammation and tears up your arteries. LDL is there to try to fix it. So now here we have cardiovascular disease, the diagnosis. So if your non-HDL cholesterol is at this number like 110 or so, just like down here, your chance of getting diagnosed with cardiovascular disease goes up right here. Okay, so now you got a diagnosis. You got cardiovascular disease. But your mortality is still lower than normal, and you're healthier for it. You live longer right here. Isn't that interesting? So this is a huge discrepancy in all of PubMed and all of medicine. The higher your non-HDL cholesterol goes up, the longer you live. And the higher your non-HDL cholesterol goes up, the more likely you get diagnosed by a cardiologist with heart disease. But yet you live longer. This is the same study, and now we're talking about conditions such as BMI, blood pressure, related to age. So here we have age 50, age 60, 70, and 80 for BMI. For blood pressure, we have age 50, 60, 70, 80. For um, here's diabetes on the right, we have age 50, 60, 70, 80. So here's that number one right, right here again, and this is for cardiovascular disease. So if you have diabetes, your hazard ratio, very, very high, is like 4.0. Your hazard ratio of getting diagnosed with cardiovascular disease is crazy high. Right there. It makes sense, right? It's the biggest risk factor. And then this is all-cause mortality. So your chances of dying are very, very high with diabetes right there. And then same thing with smoking. We all know that smoking kills you, and you get an increased chance of getting the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease. Also, blood pressure, that's a big signal of problems. So this is above 1.0, and these are all people aged between age uh, you know, 50 to 80, blood pressure here, and this is all-cause mortality. But what about non-HDL cholesterol? So your chance of getting diagnosed with non-HDL cholesterol right here is above 1.0, depending on your age. But the same thing, your mortality doesn't change. It's like if you get a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, does it really change your mortality? It's, they seem to be unrelated. And I'll explain why. And I'll get there. Bear with me. So I've been compiling the hazard ratios for heart disease. And at the very top, we have type 2 diabetes 10.2. Again, anything above 1 is bad. But it's got to be at least above 3 or 4 in order to pay attention to it. And then send this type of research off to a randomized controlled trial. Whereas all these studies here are more about um, observational studies or cohort studies. And they're not the gold standard for uh, science. But type 2 diabetes has a 10.2 hazard ratio. It's super high. Insulin resistance, 6.4. And then what's interesting here is past, re past pneumonia or sepsis where the person's hospitalized, 6.33. That's infection for that first year after their hospitalization. And then at their fifth year, the hazard ratio goes down. But even at five years, it's 1.87. Metabolic syndrome, that's also basically pre-diabetes, so 6.0 hazard ratio, crazy high. Now I'm going to jump down to the bottom. The non-HDL cholesterol, which I was talking about before, it's only 1.27. And then the small, dense lipoprotein, uh, you know, LDL, it's only 1.3. So these aren't nearly as important as the type 2 diabetes. But yet all those people that I showed you that talk about um, LDL, etc., they just focus on the LDL, and they never talk about diabetes. Now I'm going to introduce you to my cardiologist named Dr. James Roberts. I met him in 1998 when I used to practice down the road from him in Toledo, Ohio. And he's a fantastic cardiologist. He's very holistic. He looks at the body from head to toe, and he's a pioneer. On his YouTube channel, he's got seven hours talking about heart disease and immunity. It's fantastic stuff. I've listened to all of it. I grabbed a few snippets from it, and I'm going to show you that right now. So at the beginning of this video, he talks about there are 50 different microbes have been found in the artery wall. Eventually, he'll tell you how they got there. But the whole point is that if, when somebody has a lot of infections in their body, it increases their chance of having heart disease. Here we go. 50 different microbes have been found in the artery wall. 50 different bugs are present in the artery wall. How did they get there? What is their significance? Now, 12 years ago, two Finnish researchers, um, uh, Keandra and Chef Sholu, isolated nanobacterium sanguinium. This is a tiny calcium forming bacterium that they grew live out of kidney stones and calcified plaque. 
you can find these critters wherever you find abnormal calcification in the human body, kidney stones, dental pulp stones. A therapy was created to treat atherosclerosis by treating nanobacterium sanguinium. And it contained antioxidants and minerals and fish oils and vitamin D and vitamin K2. And it contained EDTA, which binds calcium to poke a hole in the shell and tetracycline to kill the microbe. And I applied this therapy to my patients and we observed in some patients profound reversal of coronary calcification. The coronary calcium score typically progresses by 40%. No one has ever shown that you can stabilize it or reverse it with a drug. However, in this patient, the coronary calcium score fell by 2,000 points with anti-nanobacterial therapy. A colleague published a series of 77 patients that he treated with what was called a COMET therapy, EDTA and tetracycline, and 57% responded with a decrease in the coronary calcium score. The mean reduction was 14%. Now, the natural history is to progress by 44%. So this is huge. 57% of the patients had an average decrease of 14% of their coronary artery calcium score. And there's no drug that does this. this there are several su supplements that do. This is one of them. This is one that I carry. It's called Nanobac TX. These are addressing infections. Interesting, right? So LDL helps the body get rid of an infection. If you have a chronic infection, the LDL is failing. The immune system is failing. People have infections for 20 years. And it can come and go maybe like a candida infection that comes and goes, a rash on the skin. Seasonal allergies are a sign of infections in the sinuses, and they come and go depending on the season. And so these organisms, they release their toxins, they destroy tissue, they multiply, they make life miserable, and they can cause heart disease. So we'll get into that right now. Also, um, pay attention to the very next thing that he says or significantly decreased in 84%. This was published, not in a cardiology journal, because nobody wanted to hear about it, but in a journal called Pathophysiology. And our experience was that it was effective as well. So it was published in Pathophysiology, not in any cardiology uh, journal, because nobody wants to hear it because there's no drug for it. It's only supplements that can reverse this. Now, I think it's appropriate that it's in, that it's in Pathophysiology journal, and it should be in cardiology journals too. But this pathophysiology mechanism, which I'll get into at the very end of this video, it's the mechanism of a lot of diseases, chronic, autoimmune, uh, rashes, um, scleroderma, multiple scler sclerosis. It's a physiological process of pathology that makes the body get worse and worse. You get symptoms, you get different diagnoses, but there is a common mechanism as to how this happens. And um, it's not something I really talked about before ever but I'll get to it at the very end of this. We are really excited. Many bugs can be found in the artery wall, typically dead. It, it turns out that the greater the number of bugs that you have high titer IgG antibodies to, representing past or current infection, the more aggressive and extensive is your cardiovascular disease. Endothelial function, the ability of the artery wall to make nitric oxide and dilate, deteriorates the greater the number of infections that you bear. If we look at outcome, following balloon angioplasty, restenosis, heart attack, or death, the greater your infectious burden, the worse you do. If we just look at three-year mortality in patients with cardiovascular disease, the more bugs you've been exposed to, the worse you do. That's huge right there. The more bugs you've been exposed to, the worse you do. So these organisms, no matter where they are in the body, can have an effect on one section of your arteries in your heart. So pay attention, he's gonna go over it right now. So infectious burden plays a role in the natural history of cardiovascular disease. How do these bugs get into the artery wall? How does infection aggravate atherosclerosis? Well, the bugs in theory can invade the artery wall along the endothelial surface, or there's a blood supply to the, the outer reaches of the artery called the adventitia. So there could be infection of the artery with bugs that get into the circulation, but the greatest issue is monocyte hitchhiking. Now remember, an inflamed plaque is releasing an adhesion molecules. So any monocyte float around in the circulation, if it comes across that plaque, it will be pulled in. So let's say you got gum disease, or you got H. pylori, or you got a urine tract infection, or a skin condition. White cells will enter those regions, gobble up the bacteria present, begin to kill them. They'll enter the circulation to go to a lymph node. If in that process, they're floating around your coronary arteries, they come across an unstable plaque, they're going to get pulled in to help out fighting this battle, this pseudo battle against oxidized LDL, where they will die. 
leaving their protein snippets of microbes obtained elsewhere in the body into the artery wall. So those protein snippets will be presented to T cells. So we will see T cells in the artery wall of a patient with plaque specific for microbes that were picked up elsewhere in the body. So these bugs aren't really invading the artery wall. Their carcasses are being brought in, but their carcasses aggravate the immune response. So that's huge right there. Okay, so if you have one person and they have a sinus infection and it comes and goes maybe three times a year for five years, that that increases the risk for heart disease problems. And if you have another person who's very, very ill and they have a constant infection, like their skin is always rashy, and let's say they have parasites. I got patients pooping out parasites every day for a year or two. I've had patients since 2007. I get stories every week. Somebody's weird parasite comes out of their nose or you know they describe or they take pictures of the parasites that come out of their butt. These are huge factors that medicine completely ignores. It's so rare that a, a medical doctor will find a parasite and then apply the right program. It's got to be a nutritional supplement. Antiparasitic drugs are good. I have patients take them. They, I send them to medical doctors. They go, get, they go get drugs. But I see over and over again that supplements are superior, believe it or not. And also, too, um, candida and mold. And, I mean, when I had mold, I, I didn't know it. I, saw, I went to a bunch of doctors. I went to holistic doctors. And uh, no, nobody ever asked me, do you live in a moldy house or have you worked in a moldy building? I asked that for every single one of my patients. Mold can raise uh, lipoprotein A and other cardio cardiovascular uh, markers when in actuality it's, it's working for the immune system. And mold and its mycotoxins are problems that the immune system has to deal with. So it's not just, when I say infection, I, I'm not just saying acute bacterial that needs amoxicillin at the local um, medical clinic or urgent care. I'm talking about uh, decades old and enduring uh, festering infections that maybe don't cause um, fever and they don't cause um, bone chilling shakes like a bacterial uh, infection can. I'm talking about like Epstein-Barr and it has this like underlying fatigue all the time. And it can come and go, or it can be persistent. Then you get a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So any of these can be a factor related to your heart disease. Now that you have this bigger picture idea, now what do you do? Well, if you're a doctor, you can't just give somebody antibiotics every day for a year or six months. And it's not about just killing the organism. It's more about you have to repair the whole body. You have to make the tissues strong and viable again. Because right now, the person who is sick has non-viable tissue. Their tissues are dying, and they can tell where. They can feel it. Oh, my brain doesn't work as well. It's more mushy. Or my, my joints are weak. My ankle twists more often. My digestion's messed up. They know where their body's falling apart. And in, the, in those locations, the tissues are literally falling apart. And their cells are dying, necrotic tissue. And you got to repair that. So you got to clean it out. You have to detox you have to drain out um, mucus and pus. You have to add in uh, nutrition, supplements, and food to repair the tissue. Now, what's the one food that repairs the tissue more than any other food? That is meat. And what is the one food that destroys the tissue more than any other food? And that is the seed oils. I just showed you like 20 studies to prove it destroys human tissue. But yet you talk to a conventional medical doctor or a government agent, USDA government agent, they're going to say, oh, seed oils are the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they're not. They're destroying your tissue, and they oxidize LDL, and they harm your eyes, and they harm your hormones, and they cause more pain, et cetera, et cetera. So here we have a list of infections known to cause atherosclerosis. I got this from two different PubMed studies. Infections can trigger atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of arteries caused by plaque buildup. Chronic smoldering infections. And they include chlamydia. Here's uh, gingivalis, which is a dental. It comes from the mouth. H. pylori, um, influenza A, hep C, cytomegalovirus, HIV, herpes 1 and 2, Merrick's disease. That's a virus from poultry. And then down here we have um, coxsackie virus, adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and parvo from dogs. Endocarditis can be caused by bacteria, and pericarditis can be caused by parasites. 
And then at the end here, I put in visceral fat. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, these infections are, are known to cause atherosclerosis. It's in the medical research. So we can't ignore this. And there's more than this too, maybe candida, maybe Borrelia from Lyme disease, Bartonella, Ehrlichia. And I've looked for Borrelia in PubMed and I did find a relationship. There is Borrelia endocarditis, inflammation of the heart caused by Borrelia. So that's a Lyme organism. So Lyme is really rarely ever diagnosed correctly in the medical field. There's just a lot more knowledge that needs to be applied to get chronically sick people well. So at the end here, I put visceral fat. And Dr. Roberts will talk about that in a moment. And as a general rule, the lower your cholesterol, the greater is your mortality risk with heart failure. As a general rule, the lower your cholesterol, the greater the mortality risk for heart failure. People with heart failure and high cholesterol do better than people with um, low cholesterol. Why? One of cholesterol's jobs is to sop up bacterial lipopolysaccharide. Bacterial lipopolysaccharide, that is an endotoxin made by bacteria. It's just bad stuff that needs to be cleaned up. And in the research, I found stuff about gram-negative uh, bacteria releasing these L lipopolysaccharides. LDL is a soap. Look at this, cholesterol soap. It pulls in garbage. It cleans. LDL is trying to clean the infection that's in your heart. It's not causing the infection. It's cleaning it. Just picture this inside your arteries. But the problem is when the infection is smoldering and chronic, it's been there for two years or 20 years, and your immune system isn't taking care of it, it calcifies. And that's the disease process. The inflammation is trying to help, but the inflammation doesn't succeed because the organism is winning this battle. And then the, the organism, the infection gets worse and worse. You get more and more biofilm and mucus from the organism, and that turns to stone. We'll get to that at the very end. Okay, so chronic infections will beat you down, beat your immune system down, but the LDL stays high in order to try to battle this out all the time. Now, those are correlated with each other, high LDL and the infection, high LDL and the placking, high LDL and disease, but it's not causing it. It's there. It's trying to help. Also, cholesterol is an antioxidant. Free radicals will oxidize cholesterol and LDL, but that serves to quench free radicals. So as heart failure is associated with free radical stress and um, bacteremia, high cholesterol is actually protective. So lowering cholesterol with statins would seem kind of like a dumb idea. What happened in these patients? They did much better. Mortality was less with statin therapy. There was a 62% reduction in death rate, 12 versus 31 deaths per 100 patient years. That's one fewer death for every five patients treated with a statin. That's a very powerful therapeutic. So the statin drug is very important when somebody's eating a junk food diet and their LDL goes up and they are unwilling or unable to do a low carb diet. With a junk food diet, you get the small dense LDL and you have the diabetes and you have the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go on a low carb diet, you lower the triglycerides, increase insulin sensitivity, and if your LDL goes up, that's the soft, big, fluffy LDL that's really, really good for you, your immune system. Now your body has a chance to kill the infection that's been raging for 10 or 30 years. Now you're giving your body an opportunity to repair itself. The best food to repair the immune system is meat. The immune system consists of collagen and membranes and skin and white blood cells, capillaries, lymphatic nodes and vessels, and fluids. These are all protein-based tissue and fluids that make everything work well. So your immune system is basically all aspects of your body. It includes your thymus gland, your pancreas gland, a strong stomach acid, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wanna destroy your body, you just eat a lot of bread and uh, grains and you avoid meat, just like all, what all the institutions are trying to make you do, and, you, and then you destroy your body. You just get softer everywhere. When you eat more meat, your body tissue becomes stronger or more, and more solid. You can dump excess fluid that you've been, your body's been holding on to because it can't balance out its proteins and the hormones are off. So meat is the most important food to get your immune system back, and there's a lot of people that go on a meat-based diet and their LDL goes up. It's not a bad thing. 
it only is a bad thing when you're eating junk food. Now, total mortality was decreased by 62%, sudden death by 57%, death due to heart failure, pump failure by 70%. Now, historically, the lower the cholesterol, the worse you do, but not with statin therapy. Lowering cholesterols with statins had a beneficial effect. So there is an argument for a statin therapy when you're eating a high-carb junk food diet. So the two camps are eating meat and um, focusing on that as a primary ca uh, source of calories. Then the other one is reduce the meat, and then you have this wide variety of many plants and other foods that will keep you satisfied, and they're colorful, and they're flavorful, and they're seasonal, and you can cook with them, and you make big salads, and you pour sal uh, salad dressing on top. And, um, but the meat is more satisfying more satisfying than all the other things put together. So here's a study from Dr. Christopher Gardner. He is a Stanford researcher. He's been doing some really creative uh, clinical trials on diets, and he's a vegan since 1983. He's never been in ketosis. He doesn't eat meat. Um, he thinks meat is bad for the environment. But he did this study called Diet Fits. And in the study, it's proven that when people eat meat, they're, it's better for them in that they avoid junk food. They avoid sugar and refined grains. So meat is the most satisfying type of food that will keep you away from ultra-processed food. And this is Dr. Gill, the MD, PhD I mentioned earlier, brilliant man interpreting Dr. Um, Christopher Gardner's work. Both of these men are vegans, by the way, and they're pro promoting a low-carb meat-based diet through this study. Now, there was an important caveat, specifically in the fat restriction group. So here's Dr. Aronica explaining what happened. One surprising fact was those following an ultra low fat diet for three months ended up uh, actually uh, increasing their um, uh, consumption of refined grains by over 50% by the study end. And in contrast, uh, those following a high fat ketogenic -like diet, um, although they at three months, although they, they slowly reintroduced refined carbohydrates um, throughout the study. At the end of the study, they had reduced the intake of refined grains by over 50% compared to baseline. So just to show you the numbers on that refined grain intake, around 100 grams a day of intake at baseline, no significant difference between the two groups. By three months, lower in both, especially on low-carb, dramatic reduction on low-carb, almost no refined grain intake. And by one year, both had gone up, both had rebounded a bit, but much less on low-carb. The low-carb group is still getting about half of the refined grains they were eating before the trial, whereas the people cutting fat were actually eating more refined grains than before the trial, and four times more than people on low-carb. Added sugars, similar picture overall, about 50 grams a day intake before the trial, no significant difference between three months, both reduced, especially low-carb, and by one year, both rebounded and less so on low-carb. So when Dr. Gardner did the study, he told the two groups of people he said, if you, you know, when you're doing low fat or low carb and you feel uncomfortable or you're craving something or you're at a party and you want to cheat, go ahead and cheat. So basically, the low fat people could barely stand this horrible diet that they were on, the low fat diet. And they increased their refined grains tremendously at 166 right here. And their baseline was at 114. And at three months, they're at 81. So they had to double it from, from 81 to 166 because the diet drives people, low-fat eating drives people to junk food. The low-carb people, they, their baseline refined grains consumption was at 93 um, grams, I think it was. And at three months, as directed, they went to a very low-carb diet. That's their diet for this arm of the study. And after one year, they still were very, very low-carb. So this is amazing. They're avoiding junk food. Low carb eating makes people, helps people avoid the worst food on the planet. But low fat eating, like the Mediterranean diet, the vegetarian diet, people cheat all the time. That's how this works. So you see the comparison here. The low carb people had four times less refined grains than the low fat people. And with the refined sugar, same story. The low carbers were only at 10 versus the low fat were triple the low carb diet at the end of the study. Now we're gonna get back to Dr. Roberts. He's gonna talk about visceral fat. It acts like an infection. Now throughout several years, I've been thinking like, okay, there's gotta be more than just this kind of infection in the body. And there's gotta be more than just like an organism, mold, virus, bacteria, parasite. There's gotta be more because 
people who have heart disease, they don't always have an infection. They don't always have a virus or a candida or something. Is there something that I'm missing? And the answer is yes, and it's visceral fat. Visceral fat acts like an infection. Visceral fat, our beer belly fat in our guts. Mother Nature didn't plan on this. The blood supply to fat is low, but it's particularly limited in visceral fat. The more visceral fat you have, the colder it is, the lower is the level of oxygen. If we measure temperature and oxygen tension in visceral fat, it is low in overweight individuals. The heavier you are, the colder the visceral fat is, the lower is its oxygen tension. That's not compatible with normal physiology. If we have visceral fat, the hypoxia, the low oxygen tension, causes the heart cells to become dysfunctional, they actually die. This is huge because I've talked a lot about lactic acidosis as the most common mechanism of chronic disease. Uh, I figured this out back in 2017. It really took me like three years to really understand all aspects of it. And I'm talking about lactic acidosis as defined in 1932, not the current definition of it. But it's all about too much waste and not enough oxygen. Here's O for oxygen. Here's W for waste. You can have a lot of waste like this. Like when I had black mold, I had a lot of mycotoxins. My oxygen was here. And my waist was climbing up, 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 and I had all these symptoms. Well, in this case, he's talking about visceral fat decreasing oxygen. So here's waist, here's oxygen, oxygen going down. It's the same effect, whether it goes like this or like this or like this. And this is damaging to the human body. And just like he said, it's not conducive to normal physiology. So nowhere in our history was did we have visceral fat unless there were just like a few exceptions. So when you have more protein, less calories from fat and carbs, then you're going to be slimmer abdominally, viscerally. So you're going to have less visceral fat. If you lose the weight, will you lose the inflammation? So with visceral fat, you're loaded with white cells. They're inflammatory. You lose the weight. The white cells leave. The residual cells shift to a non-inflammatory, more of a T-reg environment. That's why weight loss is so important. When you lose the weight, you lose the inflammation. This inflammation is driving atherosclerosis and heart failure. If you have advanced cardiovascular disease, you're overweight. If I don't help you lose weight, I'm not going to quiet down the immune response. You may have heard the term TOFI, T-O-F-I, stands for thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So you can have somebody that looks like me real thin, but then abdominally and viscerally, they have too much fat embedded in their liver, in their pancreas, in their spleen, all around their intestines, and that's, that's very damaging. Now, there are two different types of fat. One is metabolically healthy, and the other one is not metabolically healthy fat, that's brown fat, and it has its own metabolism. It's, got, it's making ATP production. It's creating heat. And then the um, unhealthy fat, that's white fat, it's got the low oxygen, and that's pathogenic. And what causes more pathology to our cells, including to our fat cells, is sugar and also the seed oils. So the more of these two types of foods that you're eating will cause damage to all your cells and destroy all your tissues and create illness from head to toe, and then infection from head to toe. And then what happens when you have an infection? We're going to get into that right now. So the big question is, what actually causes the plaque and the calcification that occurs with heart disease and other problems, maybe even arthritis, kidney stones, gout, that kind of stuff? And it says, but what causes the calcification? It is well known that calcium phosphate and mineralizable matrix-like collagen fibers are sufficient to induce tissue calcification Dead cells and necrotic tissues form an excellent mineralizable matrix. And in this case, the process is called dystrophic calcification. Deposition of calcium as calcium phosphate crystals in body tissues in areas that have been injured or damaged. Calcium deposits may form when there is necrosis, tissue death, due to injury or other damage, and often associated with trauma, infection, or inflammation. Dystrophic calcification can occur in atherosclerotic plaques, damaged heart valves, and then lymph nodes in the presence of tuberculosis infection. So it's like you have a bucket of water and you pour sawdust on top of the water and it just kind of collects together like this and maybe stick to the edge of the bucket. It doesn't dissipate, it doesn't sink to the bottom. There are electrostatic and electromagnetic type forces in physics that are in play here and it's making the uh, sawdust stick together. And this can happen in the damaged tissue from uh, injury, trauma, or infection, uh, inflammation. It, it can also happen in no normal healthy tissue, and that's called heterotopic ossification, a pathological condition of ectopic bone formation or calcification. This mechanism is in the viscera, 
and it um, occurs when calcium deposits in previously normal tissue. And this can happen in the commonly targeting the intima and tunica media of vessels, blood vessels. So inside the inside tissue of arteries, especially those in the lungs, pleura, endocardium, in the heart, kidneys, and stomach. So whether the tissue is damaged or not, you can have this collection of dead tissue, collagen-like fibers, um, calcium, phosphate, and this and, and biofilm, mucus. It's just garbage. It just needs to be cleaned out. It needs to be drained out. So in my seven-step process that I call the seven-step blueprint to optimal health, drainage is step three. Detoxification is step six. Like the process I have for healing the body from head to toe includes reversing this. And this kind of supplement right here, it does a great job of breaking through the calcium because it's got the EDTA derivative, just like what Dr. Roberts was talking about. It's got uh, vitamin C and grapeseed extract to kill the organism, the nanobacteria sanguinum. It's got enzymes to clean up the blood. That's part of drainage. And it's got niacin to vasodilate the arteries and flush out the system. Soon in the future, I'll have more videos on the same subject. And I'm thinking the next video will be about various patients who have experienced uh, healing with this sort of approach of going after calcification and organisms that are affecting various parts of their body, not just their heart, but other areas too. It's a fascinating subject. Now, I'll be honest. In my career, you know, I like to figure out puzzles. I like to think. I like to uh, read and learn. I love learning and teaching. But I've been on a roll in the last four weeks or so. And the reason why, to be honest, is because I started taking this. Now, I had a patient from London. I did a video with him. I interviewed him for a regular patient visit. It's on my YouTube channel. And he's, he started taking this. And in six weeks, it opened up his heart. He had three vessels that were blocked. And he, after six weeks, all of his pain was gone. He's walking 10 miles. He was never out of breath during his walk. Uh, huge improvements. And who knows, we'll find out later in the next few months whether or not those arteries started to open up. But based on that, you know, and I've been selling this for like six years or so, but I never took it until about a month ago. So I've been taking it. It's been fantastic. And the very next day after my first dose, my brain lit up. Like it caught on fire, like I'm, I'm able to process and carry with me big thoughts, multiple ideas, and I'm thinking about what this person said and what this person said and what I read over here and remembering things from a long time ago and putting it all together. And that's why I can sit here and argue that LDL is not the cause of heart disease. It's trying to help. It's infection that's causing heart disease. And they have way more studies to go over to prove this how these, the lipids and lipoproteins are part of the immune system. So there's not too many people talking about high LDL for the immune system. So you just heard Dr. Roberts talk about it. I'm talking about it. And there's one more person I'm going to feature. I'll put his video at the very end here. But I messaged him yesterday. He's very active and very well known in the low-carb carnivore community. He's been studying lean mass hyperresponders for a long time. That's a condition where people eat a low-carb, high-meat diet, and their numbers... Um, their LDL goes sky high, their triglycerides go really low, and it's a probably a genetic thing, and it's not related to chronic infection. And these people are very healthy, they're lean, they're athletes, and they have very high cholesterol on a low on a low carb meat based diet. And um, I messaged him yesterday, and I said, "Hey, I got this idea. LDL is for the immune system; it goes up to fight infection." And he agrees. As a matter of fact, he did a video five months ago. And he explains the mechanism that he discovered in the literature. And then I'll put that video at the very end of this. So there's three people that I know of talking about the immune system needs LDL and LDL goes up in, to fight an infection. In a future video, I'll post all these studies explaining my stance that the immune system needs LDL to go up to, in order to help fight an infection. But to conclude, when you plug in this factor that LDL is for the immune system, it solves a lot of questions that both camps have. The low-carb people and then the high-carb, low-meat people, they have um, holes in their arguments. And when you include this idea that there's an infection there, it makes sense. Now it makes sense. Otherwise, if we don't understand this, there's always going to be a battle with no conclusion, and then the uh, general population will be confused. So start thinking in terms of, okay, where's the infection that I have in my body that's making the LDL go up? Is it your visceral fat? Is it your toenail fungus? 
Is it H. pylori? Is it E. coli? What is it? And then fix it. And um, fixing it doesn't mean just take antibiotics or antimicrobials. You have to repair your tissues and you have to do some drainage. There's going to be some supplements, some herbs, whatever it takes to get your body back in shape. And one of the biggest problems is infections in the jawbone, a bad root canal, wisdom teeth extraction sites. There can be festering infections in there. The mouth looks good. The dentist is happy. You have no pain. You have no fever. But yet you can have a big old pus ball of bacteria creating all kinds of toxins and it's getting released into your arteries and going to different locations in your body, causing problems there, causing problems in your head, in your ear, in your gut, uh, causing arthritis in your ankles, in your knees. So make sure that your teeth and your jawbone have no infection. So I have to end this video right now. I, I dumped all this information in the last whatever hour it's been and I have way more to go and we have to, we can take it down different pathways so i have more studies to show you and specifically on the immune system and the infections and ldl and what the lipoproteins do for the immune system and for different to kill off different organisms so you can follow along as we um, change the way we think about healthcare. and okay my very final thought is this there are three causes of chronic illness Number one, a bad diet. Number two, infections. Number three, toxins. So people go on a good, healthy diet. And basically what that means is they're removing ultra-processed food. If you eat more plants, fine. If you eat more meat, fine. Just as long as you're staying off the ultra-processed food, your diet, in my eyes, is pretty good. And then now you're left with two more things, pathogens and toxins. The toxins are there, and they create some disturbance in your tissues killing the tissue and the organisms love to eat the dead tissue. So usually it's both things at the same time, but it's the pathogens that cause most dis immediate destruction and you can, you can get the best results faster when you go after the pathogens. In the meantime, you can get the underlying toxins also, but it's those pathogens that they fluctuate and they spread and they multiply and divide and they um, wreak havoc on your immune system and, and the toxins, they sit in your body always causing damage consistently causing damage they don't they don't multiply they're not necessarily creating biofilm and mucus and wreaking havoc on the immune system whereas the pathogens are so it's really both things it's toxins and pathogens man there's so much research on toxins people don't talk about this on social media so and it's not that captivating what's captivating is parasites i can i can talk about parasites every day for 10 years and blow up my social media accounts but it's, it's not all of it. There's way more than just the parasites. So subscribe to my channel. Keep your eyes out for my future um, videos. I'll talk about more about pathogens, toxins, cholesterol, uh, improving health, what it takes. And if you need help with your health directly with me or one of my other practitioners, you can contact my office.